जय हिंद दोस्तों मैं हूं मेजर मोहम्मद अली शाह और आज मेरा बहुत बड़ा सौभाग्य है आई एम ट्रूली ऑनर्ड टू हैव विद मी अ पर्सनालिटी हु नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन यू ऑल नो हिम एंड ही हैज बीन द चीफ ऑफ द नेवल स्टाफ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट हाईएस्ट डेकोरेटेड ऑफिसर ऑफ द इंडियन नेवी ही इज अ 1971 वॉर वेटरन अवॉर्डेड द वीर चक्र फॉर गैलेंट्री for leading an air force column deep into the enemy air space and bombarding all their transportation and then returning back safe and sound back to home he is an alumni of the us naval war college he has been responsible for strengthening the naval tie between america and india he has also supervised excited with the uk with the with the, with the navy over here and you can he has been the commandant of the national defense academy well he needs no introduction these are just a few things customarily i said because sir what happened in the year 1998 i had once come to pay a visit to nda and we saw the commandant's house and i was really overwhelmed i was overwhelmed when we saw the house outside on the gate it was written vice admiral arun prakash and i had this deep desire for some reason to go and meet the commander at that time but i couldn't but as i say sir dreams come true it may not happen instantly sometimes it can take years sometimes decades and yes it has taken me decades for my dream to realize into reality right now for actually having met you though virtually sir sir thank you very much for taking your time sir jai hind sir <clears throat> thank you ali thank you for inviting me to your program I wish you had dropped in while you were in NDA. We could have had a cup of tea and exchanged some notes. After all, you were an <clears throat> experienced army officer. I'm sure you would have some interesting experiences to exchange. Well, thank you for asking me to be here this evening. Th- thank you very much, sir. Truly really an honor, sir. We know very for the fact that your father was the district commissioner of Leh Ladakh district of Leh, and you had your early childhood in uh, JNK. So could you tell us a bit about your early childhood, sir? And of course, you have two brothers who joined the army. Yeah. Okay, so it was an unusual childhood that, as you said, my father was in the Kashmir civil service. So we grew up in the small towns and villages of J and K. Uh, my brothers were lucky; they went to school, but I, um, you know, went from one town to the other. So I missed out on schooling. I did much of my schooling was home schooling. My mother taught us. and we learned from books and so on those days there was no google or internet etc so i did um, attend school for a couple of years but most of the time was at home either my parents or <laughs> tutors teaching me and as you mentioned when the time came for the high school um, examination that is class 10 my father was posted as deputy commissioner of ladakh le um, very isolated place in 1959 there used to be one or two Indian Airlines flights a week if the weather was good, uh, so they flew out the examination papers. Uh, so I took my exam there. So that's just to give you an idea that um, I grew up in small places like Baramulla. I was born in Anantnag, close to Srinagar. Then my father was posted in Baramulla, Kishwar, Doda, Sopor, Jammu. So places like that. So that's the background. Then after finishing school, I went to uh, college for a couple of years. because my father insisted that i should get um, some education so i attended college in chandigarh for a couple of years and then by then my mind was actually set on joining the nda because as you mentioned two of my elder brothers was brothers were already soldiers in the army so i wanted to do something a little different but that's a separate story but that's my background so when you were nda you having two brothers both joining the army didn't they aspire or bully you to join the army as well and not not the navy yes there used to be a lot of bullying because i was the youngest of the three um and of course every time they came home from the military academy or joint services wing uh, they used to try and impress me with how good the army was but i had a fascination for flying because at a very young age i had seen a movie called bridges at tokori it was a it was one of the times that i was actually in school and the school took us out for a sunday morning movie it was called bridges at tokori it was about the korean war which had just finished then in the 50s 
and the story was about an air, american aircraft carrier and william holden who was an old actor he was a pilot and when i saw him in his you know flying kit and um, shooting up targets on the ground so i made up my mind that i want to be a a pilot and then i was <clears throat> even lucky one of my uncles was in the air force and he was commanding an ncc unit in jalandhar so i had gone to spend a holiday with him and he said come along with me to work and he was in a flying club the ncc air wing and they had tiger moths civilian tiger moths so he said uh, come along i'll take you up for a ride so i think at the age of 10 or 11 i went up in a tiger moth with my uncle and it was quite a fascinating experience little frightening but fascinating so when i came down after 15 20 minutes i had by then i had definitely decided that i was going to be a pilot and that it going to be a pilot in the navy so all the persuasion and bullying of my brothers didn't work i said you chaps are in the army i'm going to do something different from you so that was the background so um, when i joined india i had given all my choices were navy uh, etc so that's the background to my <laughs> naval career mm. sir any particular memories you have of your academy days when you were training sir let me share well, as i told you i i you know i was sort of pitted against boys from senex schools and public schools and you know so on who were very good at Uh, sports and outdoor events and all that but i managed i uh, i eventually i became a squadron cadet captain much to my own surprise but i managed to pull along um, doing reasonably well in studies and in in outdoors it was actually great fun a lot of camaraderie and you know as you probably know by now that um, even at a late stage in life you still remember your nda course mates the most because you get into mischief and you do all sorts of silly things and come out so it was a memorable 3 years but then we went to a training ship after leaving nda uh, we were living like uh, like miniature sort of officers you know with orderlies and bearers and waiters serving you we went to the navy's training ship and here the navy really brings the under trainees down to earth um, you know you live you you some of some of the cadets get a bunk others don't get a bunk so you find a place on the deck to roll up your little bedding and sleep Uh, then you go and fetch uh, every day there's a duty cook who goes and fetches everybody's food in a in a sort of basin and serves food then you wash your own on uh, plates and so on so the Na- navy really brings you down to earth you polish your own shoes you do your own uniform uh, so uh, time on the training ship was quite different from it was we felt let down but it was quite exciting we saw the sea uh, adventure we went abroad for the first time on the training ship we went to um, i think to malaya those days it was called malaya uh, great excitement then after 6 months on the training ship we were lucky to be posted on the aircraft carrier vikrant she was brand new she had just come in 61 and 60 year four we landed up on board and we were totally thrilled at least i was because for the first time i saw uh, things that i have dreamt of you know aircraft taking off from the deck and landing into the wires and pilots strutting around with helmets under their arms so um, the navy navy training was far more exciting and eventful than than in the three years in india sir you subsequently were the third commanding officer of uh, ianets virat as well sir we will come to that as well but sir tell us after that when you were a young officer when you when you were leading an air force uh, column into pakistan over, over the the air space where you were decorated with the veer chakra where you were awarded for that So could you tell us a bit about that operation sir Well I'll have to tell you um, a little bit of my life story also before that so I got commissioned before I got commissioned I had decided that I I would specialize in aviation so as soon as I got commissioned I volunteered you have to in the navy you have to volunteer for flying it's like any other specialization some people specialize in gunnery others in anti submarine navigation so on so I volunteered for flying and promptly I was packed off to the air force so we started our flying training in a place called <clears throat> bamroli india allahabad uh, then that was the first stage we learned on basic trainer then we went to uh, the next stage in jodhpur and the final stage was in uh, hyderabad near high sikandrabad in jets so that was the most exciting part um, we reached, we were flying jets those, those days you know jets were relatively new 1966 um, but as i was coming to the end of my flying training about to get my wings of gold you know very uh, uh, you know much sought after uh, just a few hours before um, i was about to pass out and get my wings 
I landed up in a bit of trouble. I went in, my aircraft went into a spin. I couldn't recover from it, lost control, and I had to bail out. Now that jet didn't have an ejection seat. Nowadays you have ejection seats, you just pull a handle and you pop out. <clears throat> there I had to unstrap myself from the seat, climb out of the aircraft. The aircraft was spinning all the time, you know, throwing you in and out. And finally I jumped out, <clears throat> bailed out, operated my parachute, landed reasonably all right, but I broke a couple of bones. So I was grounded for six or seven months because of medical reason. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I got my wings, came to the Navy. Uh, then I converted to the Seahawk fighter. Uh, then I, the, the, big, the big day was yet to come when, when finally after a lot of training and practice ashore, we were, <clears throat> we were told that you are already fit to land on the aircraft carrier. So we went out to sea and uh, from about 10,000 feet, you see a little... The ship looks, I mean, even an aircraft carrier looks about this size, matchbox size, and you are really aghast that you expected to land on board. So anyway, uh, again, we, we like everybody else, I landed on board. And uh, once you do three landings and three catapult shots, you know, from an aircraft carrier, you land with the help of a hook and a rest of wire. And take off is with the help of a steam catapult. It's quite an exciting affair. So once you do three of those successfully, then you are called deck landing qualified D dlq now that that's the holy grail of a naval aviator that i am a dlq then after that you walk around with your chest out so having done that i was sort of settling down on the ship uh, you know trying to get my bearings and learning how to fly at sea which is quite different from flying on land i was <clears throat> then suddenly to my surprise i was told that you have been nominated to serve with an air force squadron on an exchange posting exchange posting meant that the Navy sent two pilots to the Air Force and the Air Force sent two pilots to the Navy for two years or so, just to get experience of each other's environment. So due to that, I landed up uh, in an Air Force squadron, which is number 20 squadron, which was, which was flying hunters in those days. It was based in a place called Hinden near, uh, near New Delhi. So uh, end of 1969, I converted to the hunter aircraft, which was of course, much bigger and much faster than the Seahawk, than anything in the I had flown. And uh, having converted, then I was posted to 20 squadron. As I said, it was in Hinden and I joined my, my new squadron. Uh, and by then, um, 1970s, this, um, you know, trouble had started, end of 1970s, trouble had started in East Pakistan. And in a few months, my squadron was moved from Hinden to Pathankot, which was quite close to the international border. And we could make out from the newspapers and so on that trouble was brewing. Um, whether it would, we would go to war or not, nobody was sure, but certainly something was going to happen. So, um, so in December 71, when war actually broke out, uh, I was still with the Indian Air Force. And then for the next 15, 20 days, I flew with, with my squadron. I was very much a part of the squadron. I tried to go back to the Navy. I said, I must... Uh, go back to my own uh, naval comrades, but naval headquarters said nothing doing. And my own squadron commander, Wing Commander Parker, who later on he got on Mahavir Chakra and the war and later became an air vice marshal. He said, I've, I've spent valuable flying hours in training you to fly the hunter. There's no question of your going back. So I happily stayed on. And then we took part in the operations, whatever the squadron was tasked with. So that's the, uh, the long story behind my being with the Air Force in 1971 and um, everybody used to look in, uh, with surprise at me, what's a naval chap doing in a place like Pathan Court. So I had to explain my presence to everybody. Sir, sir and while as you were talking, I just I thought I must congratulate you as well because just today the Indian Navy has inducted, uh, they have launched two, uh, two of the sea uh, 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 two, uh, two of the sea ships, in fact, uh, warrior ships, uh, INS Surat and INS uh, Udegri. So that is in, in Mumbai. So the, our defense minister, in fact, he even said that we will not only make in India, we will make for the world. And that seems to be a, a very nice vision going across. Sir. So thereafter, you also have been an alumni of the presti prestigious US War College of uh, the Naval War College in, in US. And so could you tell us a bit about your stint in the US at that time, sir? Yeah, so um, as, as a captain, um, which is equal to a colonel in the, in the army, 
I was uh, nominated to attend the U.S. Naval War College, which is on the in a place called Newport on the East Coast. It's an international course where people from about 25 odd countries get together, people of the same rank to captain's rank. So it was quite an education to see, um, you know, how the American system works. They made sure that they exposed you to the American system of governance, of, of defense planning uh, and that kind of thing. And also you had your, um, your classmates were from, you know, like I said, 25 different navies. So it was a huge learning experience and a good exposure for a middle-ranking naval officer to see uh, a the American system, um, how it works. As I said, both both the civilian uh, administration of the United States as well as the military organization uh, of the United States, and also the how you compared with other navies. And we were fortunate; we had you know people from our neighborhood. We had a Pakistani captain. Uh, who became a good friend we exchanged notes uh, you know regularly we played squash regularly and coincidentally a few years later when i came home and i became the navy chief uh, just a few months later my pakistani classmate also became the navy chief so oh. you know it was it was a very pleasant uh, experience there. so similarly uh, other classmates all over the world from that naval war college course you know they rose to various positions and we kept in touch so it was a good experience um, but as a, as, a, as a result of that, I, I didn't attend the Na National Defense College. But well, I had to, you know, accept that this was this was itself a, a quite a learning experience. Of course, That's what the was, of course, sir. <laughs> sir, tell us about the the exercises you have supervised between India and uh, UK. You have you have supervised several exercises with them as well. Uh, UK, my experience was that um, you know I had a as a, as a commander, as a senior commander, I was uh, nominated to uh, command the new Sea Harrier Squadron. So, as I told you, we were till then flying an old aircraft called the, the Sea Hawk. It was a, just after World War II, the first generation jet. Um, and we had run out of those aircraft. They are you know, very old and uh, unserviceable. So, after a lot of, uh, <clears throat> lot of uh, thinking and, and selection procedure, the Navy decided to acquire the Sea Harrier. The Sea Harrier was a vertical takeoff and landing fighter. It was quite a unique revolutionary aircraft. But it was very suitable for us because we had a small aircraft carrier, Vikrant, which couldn't take sophisticated aircraft like the Phantom or, or the Crusader or whatever. So at the, at the same time, the British Royal Navy was also acquiring the Sea Harrier. Uh, we, almost simultaneously, we decided to acquire it. So, I was designated to be the commanding officer of the first CRA squadron. So, we went to, U, uh, to UK. Uh, first, we went to the Royal Air Force, where we learned to fly basic, see, the basic Harrier, which the Royal Air Force also flew. Uh, now, the problem with the Harrier was that it was half helicopter. It could virtually stop in the midair and hover, stand still at zero speed. It could even move backwards and then it could also be a normal fighter. It could go up to 500 miles per hour and, you know, uh, and uh, uh, attack with bombs, rockets and guided missiles. So it was a dual kind of uh, enabled aircraft. So you had to not only be a reasonably good fighter pilot, but you had to have the attributes of a helicopter pilot also because hovering an aircraft uh, takes some other kind of uh, qualities. So we learned to how to fly the Harrier with some difficulty, I must admit, with the Royal Air Force. And when we finished our training, then our own brand new Sea Harrier started being produced by British Aerospace, by which time uh, our sailors, our technical officers also arrived in the UK. So we virtually raised a new squadron in a place called <coughs> Yeovilton, which was a Royal Navy base there. They had a they had two Sea Harrier squadrons, which had just come back from the Falklands War. This was 1982. So these people had just come back from Falkland, very victorious. And they also they had also flown the Sea Harrier against the Argentinians. And the British, the Royal Navy claimed that they had um, shot down some 55 or 60 um, uh, Argentinian aircraft for the loss of one Sea Harrier. So it was a very, it was very good news for us. So, um, so we spent about a year in, in the UK uh, while, of course, we polished our own skill because the Sea Harrier was uh, quite a sophisticated aircraft. It had a radar, 
it had an air to air missile it had an <clears throat> air to surface missile and um, it was a single pilot air aircraft so with a small tiny little radar screen you had to detect an enemy aircraft then you had to close into him fire so <clears throat> it took a lot of uh, learning and then our technical people had to learn how to maintain the aircraft so all that took about a year so when when we finished our training then the question came how to send the aircraft back to india so we decided that um, at least the, the first three aircraft we should fly them back so it was more than 5000 nautical mile flight uh, so three of us one british pilot and two of us indian pilots we flew the aircraft uh, via um, Malta. Uh, then um, from Malta we went to UAE, and then from UAE we we came to um, Goa. So it was a long flight, five thousand miles, but quite exciting and good experience. So that was my UK experience. Sir, sir, and how was it going back to your alma mater to be the commander now? From where you had trained, where you are a cadet, and now you are now the Commandant of that academy, sir. How was that experience? How was that feeling? From ninety-seven, yeah, well, it was quite a quite an experience. Um, um, I, I went back after thirty-four years. I didn't have the good fortune of serving as a divisional officer or a squadron commander. Uh, so, uh, after thirty-four years, the academy had was a changed place. Actually, I mean, uh, out externally, it looked the same. You know, the buildings are all you've been there. Uh, buildings are all very solid and so on, but. the ethos of the academy had undergone a lot of change and of course rightly so three decades is a long time uh, it was a new generation of young man uh, young men so um, i ha- it took me some time to get used to this the, the, the new ethos of doing things and how training had had changed uh, of course in many ways it had changed for the better because in our times uh, we uh, the academic uh, syllabus was very very basic um uh, and a lot of stress was laid on outdoors and so on uh, now when i came as commandant i found that not only had the academic syllabus been enhanced in, in, in many ways it was a much more profound syllabus there were boys were nda had been affiliated to jnu jawaharlal nehru university and boys were getting degrees and so on so obviously the academic syllabus had uh, had been enhanced made deeper and broader which was a very good thing but along with that the outdoor syllabus had also become even tougher and more difficult you know the swimming test the pt test the, the, the virar day there was no we we never carried arms and weapons now they were doing rifle drill and so as sword drill and so on so overall the burden on a young cadet was much more than it was in our days uh, so i realized that i mean i but there was no there was no getting away from it because as as i said the times had changed but what uh, shook me up a little bit was that um, Uh, the ethos had changed in the sense that in our days uh, there was no physical violence you you never manhandled cadets uh, things like management etc you know what is this term the, these days that cadets can pinch things you went to ot 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 i suppose you've seen it all so um, the there was a little bit of degeneration in in the ethics and and moral standards and so on so having seen a few other uh, academies and so on so i tried to bring in what we called an honor code which was suited to the indian ethos indian culture and ethos so after a lot of discussion an interesting part was that when i discussed it with the cadets they were very they were quite happy and enthusiastic and they said all right sir we'll give it a try when i discussed it with the staff they were horrified and they said <laughs> what are you trying to do uh, but nevertheless we we implemented the honor code and i think it it stayed for some time then it was dispense with possibly it's come back again but i think it is required because uh, my my impression was that youngsters who came to the academy at that time were full of motivation and willing to work hard and you know uh, overcome all obstacles physical mental etc but nobody had shown them the right path the, the what is the right thing to do in difficult circumstances so when there was a moral dilemma the tendency was to follow the seniors and the seniors would always say take the easy easy way out you know tell the odd lie uh, pinch a pinch an item of uniform here and there so i think that was the, the 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 change that had taken place but it's a sign of the times and um, i think we we will have to find a way around it so that was my 
NDA experience mixed in, in, in many ways. Sir, sir, and then you took over as the Naval Chief in 2004 and you were also the, uh, the you, you took over from General N.C. Wedge on 31st January as the Chairman of the Chief of Staff's Committee. So now how was it different? Uh, the, the, could you tell us, we would, most of us would be familiar with, okay, the Chief, the, the Chief of the Army Staff, Air Force, Navy, but could you tell us a bit about the post of the Chairman of the Chief of Staff's Committee, sir? So Ali, uh, you know, uh, the chief's job is to is to mind his service, plan for his service, you know, uh, make sure that the, the right the right kind of people are inducted, the right training goes on, the right equipment uh, comes for your service, uh, and for all these things, you have to deal with the Ministry of Defence, with the uh, political leadership, with the bureaucracy, and so on. Uh, so that is the chief's charter is to look after his own service. The army chief looks after the army, the air force looks after the air force, and the navy does it. Now there's a, another aspect to the three services, and that is something called jointness. That that when you go to war, in, in modern day war, no service will be fighting its own war. Each service will require the help, assistance, and support of the other other two services, to to a greater or lesser extent. Um, the, the point is that, let me state this, that wars are, uh, and this will please you, that wars are never won by navies at sea or air forces in the air, no matter what. Wars are always won by armies on the ground. And navies <laughs> and air forces are there to, are there to provide help, support, etc. I, I can see you're already very happy with that statement. So that is the reason that you need to plan, train, and equip yourself in a joint manner so that when the times comes to go to war, you will be in a position to uh, to come to each other's assistance, not because you trained in NDA together, not because you were cosmates or you were friends or whatever it is, but because the system is such that when the time comes, you will come to each other's assistant support, etc., whatever is required. So that is why we used to have something called a chairman chiefs of staff committee. He was the senior most of the three chiefs he, by by date of promotion, not by uh, by date of commission, by date of promotion to the four-star rank. <clears throat> so the senior most four-star officers amongst the three became the chairman. And then you had meetings of the chiefs of staff committee where you discussed issues of mutual interest of, as I mentioned, jointness, etc. How to do things better uh, together, how to get more synergy, how to get more bang for the buck. Because um, up till up till the time that I was in service, um, all the three services did things individually, uh, and many times there was duplication, there was overlap, and therefore there was wasteful expenditure uh, in training and in you know administration and support and so on. So there were many areas there that that, that required uh, us to work together to coordinate to get more synergy to get more economy. So that was my job as chairman, chiefs of staff committee. Of course, apart from yeah. that, by then the strategic forces command had been formed. So that that chain of command, the chairman chiefs, the Andaman Nicobar command was already there. That's a joint command. So that of came course. under the chairman chief of staff committee. So that is the reason first, that why you have a chairman chiefs of staff. Now the drawback was that the chairman chiefs of staff was only there till he retired. And then the next senior most person would take over. Now, depending on you know, when you got promoted, some chairmen were there for two months. My predecessor was there for one month, General Wedge. My successor was there for three months, six months like that. So that's the reason that everyone felt very strongly that instead of having a rotational chairman, chief of staff, you should have a permanent chairman. And that meant having a chief of defense staff. So right. when two years ago, the government approved the chief of defense staff, we were very pleased with that. Uh, step because now as chairman as chief of defense staff he was also also the permanent chairman of chiefs of staff and he had other functions to perform so that is the background to chairman so i had um, i had good cooperation from my fellow chiefs uh, most of the time sometimes we didn't agree on many things so but that is all part of the game but the endeavor was to uh, create as much synergy cooperation and support to each other to create structures that would ensure this 
Sir, so you answer the doubt of mine as I had. You know, that was a dif difference between the chairman, chief of staff's committee and the CDS. Now I get it exactly, you know, that the chief of staff's committee, would, the chairman would just come. He would be there for a month, depending on the tenure, until the next senior most takes over. Yes, so that's that logically explains. Also, it, so. one more clarification that he was uh, he was equal. He, the, he had he was also a four star. The others are also four star, chief, uh, chief, uh, you know, rank officers. So he had no authority to um, to overrule them or push them into a corner. But the chief of defense staff will have that authority because he's appointed by the government as the head of the three chiefs. I mean, to to you know to. Uh, to take charge of the three chiefs. So the, he's got that advantage and he's also chairman chiefs of staff. So that's a big difference that the chairman chiefs of staff function by consensus. The CDS may or may not have consensus. So that's an important point. Understood, sir. Sir, so it is said that whoever dominates the seas, dominates the land, the very famous quote, and by chess fellow pride when he said that, you know, the wars have been won by the army. Thank you for saying that. But sir, could you explain this quote about whoever... Dominates the seas, dominates the land. Well, you would equally say that whoever dominates the air will dominate the battlefield or the battle space. They are all so you you know you have to have a certain level of maturity to to look at this whole picture of uh, you know land, air, and uh, sea maritime power, uh, and each has its own role to play. We are actually a maritime nation. You know, we are a peninsula surrounded on three sides by sea. And on the on our to our north is uh, the mountains. So the only way that you can deal with the rest of the world is by by the sea. You can't deal with you know China or Afghanistan or Pakistan or going over. I mean, you can do a certain amount of trade, but by and large, your trade, your energy, uh, your exports and imports will all come by sea. And if if somehow somebody gets hold of your sea lanes and dominates your sea lanes, he can starve you. Right. See now what's happening in Russia. Russia is being economically put under huge pressure because of the economic sanctions. Right. The same thing could happen if somebody uh, dominates your sea lanes and interrupts your uh, your shipping traffic, your exports, your uh, your imports, your energy, your your natural gas and oil. You need you every day of the year. You need three, four, five tankers to come from the Persian Gulf or Russia or wherever to dock into one of your ports and keep your oil refineries going. If for one day or two days you don't get any tankers for any reason, your refineries will start running dry, your petrol pumps will run dry. So that in a nutshell is the importance of the seas for you. That unless you can dominate the seas, your economy, your industry and ultimately your war machine can be brought to a halt by somebody else dominating the seas. So it is better that you dominate or control your own sea lanes or areas around. So, so, about, yeah. so similarly, it's, it's, air power also has, has its own place. I mean, if, if you go out to, you know, into, uh, uh, into a battlefield and your armor and infantry and everybody, if the enemy is dominating the skies, they'll knock you out in a, in a matter of few hours. So you need air power to make sure that you the, uh, the skies above you are dominated uh, by your own people, not by the enemy. So that is the... the but then at the end of the day, if you want to put boots on the ground... And you want to take or retake some territory, it'll have to be the Fauci's who do it. The rest of us will 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 clap from the sidelines. Sir, sir, during the 1971 war, in fact, when you got the Veer Chakra and that time, the our Indian Navy played a very crucial role in bombarding the port of Karachi. If I'm not mistaken, it was 4th of December 1971. And at the same time, when you had it was 4th and then 5th December, thereafter, you did your operation there. So we Curtsy Hindi movies, which are a very big influencer in our society. Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. I can't say that. But the, people like when they've seen the movie like Border, they've seen the mention of the Air Force, of the Army. There was the mention of the Navy. But the Navy played a significant role in 1971. And uh, they have played a very, very significant role. So could you just throw some light on the Navy's contribution in 1971, which I would really want our viewers to know. And this story should be told. Okay, well, you can't blame uh, the movies for this kind of thing. I mean, they, they focus on a, on one operation and they do a good job of that. So when you're talking about border, I mean, the Navy doesn't come into the picture. But the Navy did play a very significant role, both in the east, where we sent our aircraft carrier and the aircraft uh, 
from from the squadron they bombed and rocketed and strafed uh, the enemy's uh, you know their their shipping their uh, air bases their harbors ports etc so um, from the from the land side the air force was dominating the skies but from the sea side the aircraft carrier and our naval fleet was dominating so a the east pakistan command could get no support or help from any from sea seawards that was that was quite out of the question secondly as the war went badly for the pakistani if they had any thoughts of escaping by sea that also was not possible because that was a blockade by by the eastern fleet on the west um, this attack on karachi harbor apart it was a great blow to the pakistani morale because a they did not expect this such an attack uh, so you know an attack on karachi which, which is their commercial hub is like bombay for us so in the heart of karachi these oil oil tanks petrol tanks were blown up and they burned for many days it was a huge morale blow to the morale of the pakistani citizens pakistani armed forces after all the armed forces also must have felt bad the air force and the navy that um, they, they not only lost ships in the harbor they could do nothing to protect their own citizens but the most important impact of this attack in the east in the west was that once again karachi port was completely choked off no ship would come inside no ship could leave leave uh, karachi harbor in fact foreign ships which wanted to enter or leave had to ask permission from the indian navy so it was like a choke point it was like throttling their you know source of uh, imports and exports so both these operations they may not have directly impacted i mean perhaps what was happening in 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 jnk or rajasthan was not directly impacted by the navy but the overall war was certainly impacted by both these operations the the missile attack on karachi harbor and the aircraft carrier uh, operations of of the east pakistan they had a impact on the long term and uh, in the east of course it it accelerated the surrender of of the pakistani forces they may have thought of fighting on a little more they were expecting help from the us navy etc but all those ideas were knocked out because the indian navy was very much there and we were not going to allow any <clears throat> intervention sir so talking about war you know in the first world war 1914 when uh, the germans had sent their u boats to surround uh, uk and america had uh, sent out the support finally in 1917 when america actually entered the first world war when they went in to support so 16 17 18 march 1917 the germans they sunk three us ships at that time that's the time when president woodrow wilson announced war on germany and that's how america stepped into the first world war so that was the importance of the cruciality of the navy so that time sir what do you say i mean the the importance of the role of navy in the world war sir yeah so the americans were actually looking for an excuse to to jump into world war 1 so the sinking of that ship gave them that excuse that they had attacked american citizens and so on uh in the in the two world wars <clears throat> eventually it came to the same thing the united kingdom is an island nation it is dependent on everything for or or on shipping it is totally dependent for food for oil for steel for coal etc on shipping and in both the wars the germans tried to choke the united kingdom uh, great britain by attacking their shipping and they sank thousands and thousands of tons of merchant shipping uh, in this endeavor and they almost succeeded in Uh, you know bringing uh, uk to its knees but finally uh, with help with america's help britain ma- managed to uh, you know uh, revive its endeavors but uh, the german effort was to choke off all external uh, assistance to uk uh, and thereby prevail in the war so that that is the importance in, in both wars uh, submarine warfare played a huge huge role the U- battle of atlantic was fought by german u boats and at, there was a stage when when it seemed that you know uh, they were sinking more ships the U, german u boats were sinking more ships than the britain could build so they they went out to america and asked for their help so the U, uh, U, us president gave them the lend lease agreement by which they transferred a lot of military hardware and ships and so on to uh, on loan to the uk so um, the the principle remains the same that if you're lines of communication sea lanes of communication are attacked by an enemy or uh, you are in an un- unfavorable position at sea in the long run you will get 
choked your your fighting machine your economy your industry will come to a halt sir so talking about the That's war the moral we... that you army chaps must remember all right yes sir 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 talking about the war in the russia ukraine war there a lot of analysis a lot of speculation in fact that no one knows exactly what's happening in uh, president putin's mind of course but one of the analysis says that you know he plans to uh, make ukraine landlocked by taking over mariupol and from the donbas he's already taken over and the crimea he taken over in 2014 and so now if he makes uh, ukraine landlocked of course i mean which you know i know i would like our viewers to be educated on this sir how would it affect ukraine in a lot of ways it would affect them for sure but if you can throw some light on that sir you know russia has always historically russia has always been in quest of what is called a warm water port warm water ports because russia's coastline in the north is close to the uh, to the you know polar regions they get they get frozen in winter they are unusable half the year and russia has no seaboard uh, in the warm waters so at one point of time russia uh, during the tsar's time the british the british used to to imagine that the the tsars are looking for a warm water port in the persian gulf so they would come through afghanistan and india and seek a warm water port during world war 2 um there was no other port which was available so all the supplies and uh, help that had to be sent to russia went to murmansk which is you know close to the pole so it is not so much that they want to deny ukraine uh, the use of the black sea it is that they themselves they need sevastopol and mariupol those are black black sea ports they are very vital for russia uh, that is why they uh, you know they took over crimea in 2014 which was also an illegal move but there again it was a strategic necessity for russia to hang on the sevastopol was the headquarters of their black sea fleet the russian black sea fleet headquartered in sevastopol it happened to be in ukraine but strategic uh, uh, compulsions made them take over crimea where sevastopol is contained so now again the the endeavor to hold on to eastern ukraine uh, and then join up with sevastopol and odisha again odisha is a very important port it has got a lot of shipyards uh, it is one of the most important shipyard it used to be in the ussr in fact our own vikramaditya was built in odisha you know so all these ports in the black sea are of great importance to russia without these ports russia will become landlocked not not ukraine whether ukraine become landlocked is a different matter now that's that's a incident so so the importance of russian campaign at the you know in the, the shape it is taking is to ensure that it retains possession of the black sea ports and of so, course uh, it will consequently it will deprive ukraine of these ports unless they come to some understanding so there is saying sir between the devil and the deep sea or the devil and the blue sea and here i would say i would put it this way that the devil and the black sea that is the yeah. trouble that is that the deep blue sea is the black sea sure Sir, sir. Also, the sinking of Moscow. Moscow was sunk by Ukraine, and uh, apparently, we were told that. Though, of course, you cannot really uh, rely on any side, the Western media or the Russian media. The information warfare goes on, but the the news that came along was 510 sailors from the ship were rescued unharmed. Apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, whether it's to be believed or not. But sir, the sinking of Moscow. Do you think it would have been so easy to have? uh sang Mos- moscow for that matter sir yeah ali uh, I, i mean uh, my source of information is also social media and so on so it is quite uh, intriguing as to how a 12500 ton cruiser it's a big ship you know uh, how it could be sunk so easily uh, so there are two or three questions which come to one's mind and one can only throw them out one is that what was it doing so close to the coast now a cruiser is an ocean going ship and here i must interject and say that most people talk about even in our country most people talk about the navy defending the indian coastline 7500 kilometers of coastline will be defended by the navy tat ki raksha karenge now that is nonsense the na- navies are not supposed to guard coastlines navies are supposed to be out at sea in the blue waters you know hundreds if not thousands of tat rakshaks are the coast guard, the indian coast guard is called the tat rakshak so they are supposed to guard the coast the ports harbors coasts are supposed to be guarded by coast guards not navies so naval ships are meant to be out at sea on other tasks 
So my first question is, what was a cruiser, heavy cruiser doing so close to the coast, 100 kilometers or so? It, it had no business to be there. If it was there, then it, it should have known that it was vulnerable. Uh, secondly, uh, this, I mean, the, the, they are talking about a missile called Neptune missile, which is supposed to have a warhead of 150 kilograms. Yes, uh, if you hit a warship, 150 kilogram warhead will make make a hole, maybe start a fire. But uh, it's a big ship, and and sailors are trained to, uh, you know, ships come, ships crews are trained to take action battle damage, to control it. And the ship has redundancy. There is two of everything. You know, maybe not two. There may be four generators. So if one generator get knocked out, you start the other one. There are similarly uh, water supply, electrical supply. So there, there, there is redundancy. So ship can absorb damage, take one or two hits, and then carry on fighting. And even if it catches fire, there is enough equipment on board to fight the fire. We are trained to fight fire. So these are the two puzzling issues that A, why was it positioned where it was, where it was should have been known that it will come under attack. B, if by any chance, whether it was a drone or help from US, US naval aircraft or whatever, even if it took two hits by missiles, it should have been able to um, you know, retire and, and take care of itself. But the fact that it sank after two missile hits, uh, caught fire, sank, God knows how many sailors were lost. Doesn't speak very well of of the handling of the situation. So it's easy to, to to blame people without knowing enough. But prima facie, on the face of it, it looks like bad uh, bad sort of positioning of the ship, and also not very successful uh, battle damage, containing battle damage, firefighting, damage control, all these things which are taught to naval personnel was were, were not good enough that's my analysis yes, sir so about three months back the naval chief of the army staff was in india on the behalf of the invitation of idsa and he made some remarks and it was which i perceive as it was perfectly fine but the invitation card read that that invitation that that uh, talk would be streamed live which he missed out perhaps on the invitation card and he spoke something he spoke off the cuff he spoke this because between you and me and don't quote me and such things and he had to resign the same day for making a comment by of saying that uh, they can forget about crimea ukraine would never be able to take back crimea leaving that question aside but taking a lead from that question sir sir russia is fighting with the modern technology of artillery equipment in donbass areas on the other hand ukraine is being supported by the nato countries america has given them m777 uh, how is this? So do you think that Ukraine would be able to, because Ukraine is putting up a tough fight to Russia, there's no doubt about that. And no one had estimated that, actually. So do you think Ukraine would be able to take back Donbass areas from Russia, sir? Well, I, well, I felt sorry for the French naval chief, um, but he, he should have known, I mean, I'm sure he must have known uh, that um, he was likely to be quoted, but if he, if he felt like speaking his mind, there's nothing wrong in that. And mind you, what he said was that uh, all that all that Putin wants is a bit of respect from Europe. And <laughs> if somebody had paid attention to him, maybe this war could have been avoided. But anyway, that's the point. Now, the, the point is that obviously the Russians have miscalculated. Uh, A, the, uh, the, the ability of the Ukrainians to hold, uh, to fight back, to resist and even to counterattack. Uh, perhaps they, they miscalculated that because uh, Putin called it a special operation and he expected it to last for three, four days. That didn't happen. The second unexpected uh, uh, occurrence is the amount of support that Ukraine has received. We are we are only learning about what is out in the media, what has been there for the last few months or few years. We don't know the kind of training, the hardware that has been inducted into, into Ukraine. We are not aware. Today there is some, some news that uh, an American training team has been captured by the, by, the, by the Russians. So we don't know the extent of support that Ukraine has been receiving. And the ulterior motives of, of, the, of Europe and even America are not perhaps not in the best interest of Ukraine. Ukraine is going to be destroyed. But what the, what the Europeans and the Americans want is that Russia should be brought down, cut, cut down to size. That is their aim. Uh, in the bargain, if Ukraine suffers, uh, which it is, uh, I don't think anybody is particularly bothered. 
so there has been miscalculation on on one secondly the amount of support material training etc which ukraine has received uh, is is i think uh, been underestimated i think the us senate is about to pass a bill which will provide 60 billion dollars worth of aid to ukraine 60 billion dollars is the india's whole defense budget for the whole year around that figure so that's the amount of money that's going to be pumped into ukraine now with that kind of money and the hardware that it can buy i'm sure ukraine will be able to stand up so but but what you need to look see through is whether this is for the benefit of ukraine and the ukrainians or is it for the larger strategic aims of of the west those are issues we have to analyze that is very true sir so also the one more doubt i want to clear with you was about the formation of court sir when the court was proposed and the idea came about and there was also talk about the about india australia japan and america training you being a fighter pilot sir who better to uh, answer this they would be training the fighter pilots in the anderson air force base in america and you have had a stint in america as well sir so do you think cod would also be militarized at at a point sir well you know cod goes back to 2004 when the tsunami hit us then these four countries got together and it was mostly a naval affair you know cooperating with each other to render assistance to to the and then it was revived in 2007 and so on in my personal view um, just because china is opposed to the cod or the, even the idea of cod all four countries not all four but apart from america the other three countries have been soft peddling the cod Uh, in the recent foreign ministers meeting of the quad which was held i think in australia a few weeks ago they spoke of vaccines they spoke of cyber warfare they spoke of um, you know te- terrorism they spoke of north korea there was not one mention of china so it just indicated to me that there were there was a fair degree of trepidation that we should not displease china quad should not be seen as as uh, uh, you know posturing against china but everybody china knows and china says that every opportunity that they don't like the idea of cod they don't like the idea of indo pacific uh, and they say cod will disappear within like sea foam they they use that phrase so china knows and understand that cod is meant for it but the cod itself has not yet made up its mind uh, what it should make itself i mean vaccines and terrorism and all can be looked after by other bodies i have always felt that it is high time that cod should be militarized If, you know to some extent you can you can include security in its charter so far the security has been excluded deliberately by all 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 three three nations whereas america on its own makes very um, belligerent noises about china they don't hesitate whenever they publish any document uh, indo pacific strategy and all that they openly call out china as a bully uh, you know as threatening and so on but the quad has hesitated and i think the time has now come for quad to Uh, do a serious rethink and see what it is all about are we wasting our time because trade and vaccines and hd humanitarian assistance and those kind of thing can be looked after by many other bodies that is very true sir sir also i would to i would like you mentioned about atrakshak so we have a lot of dominance sort of presence about the indian navy on the in the indian, indian ocean we've had special operation we have fought pirates as well for that matter sir so what is the significance of now let's from indian ocean let's go to indo pacific china's activities in the indo pacific where they often they change islands which which actually are japanese islands so how does the activity of chinese in the indo pacific affect india sir so now uh, the, the whole idea of indo pacific was to create a bridge between the pacific and the indian oceans and make it a one a single uh, kind of a, a, a notion earlier the pacific the, the, you know uh, east of malacca strait was known as asia pacific and west of malacca strait was called the indian ocean and there was no connection between the two so when they said asia pacific is doing this uh, etc then india pakistan sri lanka were all left out so somebody in america or japan or wherever thought of this concept of indo pacific by which you bring india china everybody in this in the same sort of uh, conceptual uh, blackboard in many ways it's a good thing because 
India is rising in the Indian Ocean, China is rising on the other side. There are many over areas of overlap. Our trade goes to through the through the Pacific Ocean. Chinese trade comes through the Indian Ocean. Uh, there are many overlapping issues and concerns for both sides. So it's a good it's a good concept. Now what China is doing in the Pacific Ocean, I'm saying that side of the east of the Malacca Strait is a staking claims to Japanese island. B they have created out of rocks and shoals uh, by dredging up the bottom of the sea. They've created three to four thousand acres of land where none existed. There was only sea water. Now they've created islands. And after creating those islands, they fortified them. They built airstrips, they planted missiles, they made harbors, etc. So after this, they will now stake a claim to the ocean areas because every island has a ex exclusive economic zone. It has an area of you know of, of, uh, of influence, etc. Whereas a, a rock or a shoal doesn't have any exclusive economic zone. But once you can convert it into an island, then you have all these issues. And then they will start exerting their influence, trying to... Already they are telling other navies that they, they need permission to transit through those waters. So that is what is happening in the Pacific side. On this side, there, there is the Belt and Road Initiative, which stretches all the way from, uh, from China right across the Indo-Pacific, through Sri Lanka, through Bangladesh, through Pakistan, and Maldives and goes on to Africa. So all these, um, you know, whatever endeavors that long-term endeavors that China wants to implement, the Belt and Road Initiative, the uh, the Maritime Silk Road, they all have maritime connotations. They will all require um, the the PLA Navy, the plan to eventually land up here. Why? Because they have interests in in the Pacific. They've got islands. In the Indian Ocean, they've got interests of Belt and Road Initiative, etc. So, a day will come very soon when the PLA Navy will actually be present here. Uh, and if they need bases, then they may also create bases. Uh, Gwadar in Pakistan is being built by the Chinese. They may very much. Hamban Tota was in Sri Lanka was built by them. Uh, there is talk that in Bangladesh and Myanmar, etc. They may have bases. So these are the implications of, of the Indo-Pacific, why the Indian and Pacific Oceans have been conjoined to create the Indo-Pacific, but because there is commonality of interest. And the second point is that China's activities are going to encompass both the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So if you want to do something about it, then you need to have uh, A, conceptually, you must think across, right across, and B, physically, if you're going to form any any uh, partnerships or associations or, or treaties, then you've got to think trans, trans Malacca Straits, both Pacific and the Indian Ocean, which the, which we are doing. Sir, so one more doubt that I can't that comes to my mind is, sir, in the year 2017, Solomon Islands had signed a pact with Australia that Australia, because Solomon Islands is six major islands and 900 minor islands scattered all over. So Australia would protect them and look after them and they would give them rights to uh, deploy their military, their police, their civil deployments to look after the security and safety of Solomon Islands. Now, China has got very close to Solomon Islands of late, sir. And now there has been apparently, if, if one were to believe the news that China has signed a secret deal with Solomon Islands, which would give Chinese a right to deploy their peacekeeping forces in Solomon Islands. And Solomon Islands is 2000 kilometers away from Australia. So th the Australia would not probably accept it, perhaps. So which would come to the same thing, what the threat that Russia uh, faced when they thought that if Ukraine enters NATO. So do you think Solomon Islands and China will uh, continue their friendship and they would give their peacekeeping rights to Chinese? <clears throat> yeah, I think Australia took their eyes, eyes off the ball there. I mean, they assumed that they, they, they took the Solomon Islands for, for granted that just because they're a tiny little place. But I think that the president of Solomon Islands showed showed everybody that they are a sovereign country. They can make a partnership with anybody they want. And Chinese were obviously waiting. In fact, they've done it right across the Pacific. They have reached out to all these little islands and they will come in very handy. So if you go by those principles, they as a sovereign nation, uh, Solomon Island can sign a treaty with anybody. Who can stop them? But then if you start talking about spheres of interest, etc., then, then you know, it, it bites both ways. You can't, can't have two different standards. 
So if, if Solomon Islands has signed a treaty with China, well, it's a question of financing. They must have given them money. They must have promised to build facilities for them, infrastructure. Uh, Australia should have woken up earlier and done the same thing and not allowed um, China to uh, you know tempt them. It's the same with us. We neglect our neighbors. We don't give them help when they need it uh, or when they ask for it in a timely manner. So next next day you'll find they're reaching out to China and China is ever ready to do that. So uh, I think diplomatically you have to be very very fast on your on your feet and anticipate these things. Sir, sir, thank you very much. I mean, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, sir. Over an hour has passed, and I have learned so much about strategy, about and I got to know about your life better. Stay from from you, sir. It was an honor, sir. Last two questions that come to my mind, sir. Before I uh, part ways with you, sir, you've been commander of NDA, which I wish I had asked earlier. But then, sir, now there has been a women entry scheme into NDA, permanent commission to women officers in, in NDA. So, what do you say about that, sir? Well, I mean, giving equal opportunities to uh, women, I think, is a very noble concept. One should, and we, and, and the armed forces have always been ahead. I think we were, we were the first in Indian society as as early as the 1990s. The armed forces started accepting women officers. Uh, so uh, we are we are ahead of the rest of society in that aspect that we've given equal opportunities to women, um, but you should make haste slowly in such issues. Uh, the rest of Indian society has a long way to go. I think nobody can deny that. So we shouldn't, you know, uh, and the, the other point is that I don't think it's fair for courts of law to order the armed forces to do this, do that or the other. The armed forces should be prepared to take these steps rather than being pushed into them by orders from, from courts of law. So I only hope that um, this NDA entry for women is a success uh, because having served there and uh, having been trained there, it will take a lot of changes, a lot of adjustment to fit in the young girl cadets. Uh, and I wish luck to both the academy and the and the, and the women in, entrants. But um, such steps need to be taken with great deliberation, uh, giving yourself enough time to prepare yourself physically, mentally, in every sense, and let not let not push the armed forces ahead of Indian Indian society, as far as all this is concerned. We must take a good hard look at ourselves and see what's happening outside in, in civil society, as far as you know treatment of women is concerned. You the armed forces right, done remarkably well, and we must get, uh, take credit for that. So you answered it so beautifully. I mean, I couldn't have thought of a better answer from anyone. I mean, the way you've put your point forward. It was really, truly amazing, sir. And lastly, uh, you know, you have been the chief of personnel, which is equivalent to like the MS in the army, in a way, which was in charge of the posting and such things, sir. So if, give me an example, sir. Were you, for a spousal posting, a husband and wife who are serving in the Navy together? I mean, I was in conversation with Mrs. Ranjana Malik, sir, just yesterday, uh, the former army chief's wife, General Malik's wife. And she was a doctor in the army, in the AMC. And she was saying during her time, at that time, they said that we would not post a spouse together in one posting. It was a logic which then she didn't understand at all. So anyway, after doing a short service, she hung up her boots from the army, sir. So for a spousal posting, sir, in the Navy, as not as a chief, not as the appointment that you last held, but as the chief of personnel, what would have been your take, sir? Well, um, to the extent possible, if it helps the officers, uh, the, the service should, you know, give them uh, postings together. But it cannot be at the cost of, I mean, it cannot be at the cost of uh, the service or, you know, depriving other people. I mean, if after all, if, if equality is the, is the aim, then, then you got to take with the, the tough, tough with the, you know, easy with the tough. So, um, I think to the extent one should the service should not go out of its way to separate couples wherever possible and if possible they should try and help them but this cannot become a, a, an, an objective that just because two people are married they have to be posted it will tie up the personal branches of the armed forces into complete knots uh, this should not be an endeavor if possible certainly 
give them once in a while, give them a posting together. But it cannot become an end or an aim for personal management will become a nightmare. And um, in many other ways, it you know maybe it's not desirable because somebody else will will have to suffer. In in fact, people are already saying that uh, if if women are going to ask for easy postings and family stations and you know uh, expectant mothers and so on, then some other officer officer will have to carry that part of the burden. So if women are looking for equality, then they must take the rough with the smooth. They must not ask for special treatment. That is my frank opinion. Sir, it's been an honor and such a delight and a pleasure and great learning for me, sir. You have been taking out your time. Very, very generous, magnanimous and kind of you, sir. The gentleman was the highest, one of the officers with who has the high, the most decorated officer of the Indian Navy, the Paramishya Seva Medal, Atifishya Seva Medal, the, the Veer Chakra, the Vishish Seva Medal. All right, all right, Ali, that's enough. <laughs> all right, sir. I think it's yeah. time somebody somebody interviewed you. you. You've been a short service commission officer. You have a lot of experience. One of these days, I'll come and interview you, all right? Oh. And grill you, grill you for one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, I Thank truly, you. truly appreciate it. It's been nice, time, nice, nice being with you. Wish you all the Thank best, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jain, sir.